So, the, the topic today is uh, intention and attention. And there, some of you may or may not be aware of the distinction between the two. Um, but whenever it is uh, we begin something, there's always an, an, an intention that behind what it is we're trying to accomplish. And it's the very beginning stages of, of something, whatever it is. Um, the Buddhists would use the word motive. What is your motive? But the word intention itself has a different a different meaning than just motive. So there's this uh, from the etymological root of intendo and tari, which means to wind something up. And so you could call the winding of a clock spring intention, and the unwinding of the clock spring attention. There's there's it's it's scientifically it would be relative to centripetal and centrifugal motion. That is in in, in gravity. There's planets that are held in the orbit of the sun and they're kind of getting pulled in towards the sun and then there's that energy that wants them to pull away from the sun so there are two there are two types of energies that which moves in toward the center that would be intention and that which moves away from the center which would be attention and so in the in the creative process we would start out with an intention or a motive which begins to wind up the idea, the creative image of the thing we want to bring into the world, whatever that is. When it's an individual doing that, um, it has a certain amount of potency. When it's a group that does that, the, the potency becomes exponentially more powerful. So group intention or, uh, or motive is far more uh, likely to manifest into something than somebody, you know, trying to bring something in on their own behalf. But when we get out into the world, um, there is one particular commodity that the the world wants from you. So when you're in front of the television or when you're listening to a political ad, they want your attention <laughs> to wrap around their intention. Because there's a great mystery here that when somebody wants to accomplish something, the way in which that happens is to gather a group of people who can support that intention by their attention. And so your attention is being sought after and grabbed at every moment of your life by whatever it is, whatever context you find yourself in. So the two things that you want to watch out for is um, what is your intention relative to the things you want to bring into manifestation and who is distracting you with trying to get your attention away from the very things you're trying to accomplish in order to bring something else into manifestation. <clears throat> There's a great little poem, and this is paraphrased by Jahaladin Rumi, and talks about the difficulties of intention. And he said, When I find the woman of my dreams, I get spurned and my heart is broken. When I drink the wine I'm after, I wake up with a headache. When I go after the prize of my life, I end up in jail. I should be very careful of the things I want. That's the poem. So, there are, there are alignments also, before we begin the conversation, ar around intention. So if we think about right motive from the Buddhist point of view or intention in terms of wanting to manifest something, what is, what, what is the outcome that you're desiring to have? Is it so that you have all these goodies in your life and maybe not thinking about others? Or is it in collaboration with the greater good of the larger whole? And when that occurs, then you're going you're gonna to find that there'll be others who will align themselves with that intention and give you their attention. And that attention can be anything from their presence, their mental support, resources of any kind, whether it's money, their time, a building to meet in, uh, just a variety of things that you may never even began to think were possible. So with this simple little introduction and trying to keep it along certain lines of, um, uh, you know, this concept of real, it really is what the occultists call the magic of light. Now, it may sound a little wonky and new agey when you hear that term, but there's an actual phenomenon that occurs, and I'll give you an example. Um, and I've given this in other talks here at City Club, that when, when somebody has an intention, what they really begin to do is to create a depression in the substance of the cosmos, and that substance is called the astral light, or oftentimes called the mind stuff. Um, and the Hindus and the Buddhists talk about learning how to still the mind and be able to really um, formulate ideas and, and 
uh, images of the things you want to manifest. So there's an, a depression that's occurred in this stuff. That same phenomenon occurs in the creation of, of a hurricane. So you hear when when the, uh, the, the forecast say, well, there's a tropical depression off the coast of Cuba. And it may, it's beginning to rotate, and it's beginning to become a tropical storm because it's only moving at a certain speed, and then when it reaches another speed, it becomes a hurricane. But it's, if you look at the satellite images, it's a vertical motion that turns, and it has access to all the things necessary to make it the very best hurricane it can be. What moisture, temperature, cool temperature, warm temperature, water, warm, cool air, and, and this whole idea of rotation. That same phenomenon that occurs in, in, in the element of water with air and so on occurs every time you have a creative image. And there's a depression that occurs first, so it starts to organize itself. And as it organizes itself, um, it starts to take on its own life. And if you don't give it a t attention or attention, then it, d it fizzles out as a depression and never gets organized. And so the, these are some of the fundamentals of, of creation and um, that we participate in all the time, whether we know it or not, that every time you have an image about something, um, you begin this vertical motion. And a lot of times it never goes anywhere. But a real keen attention to that whatever it is that you feel emotionally, mentally, and physically jazzed about something the juices are flowing in your body around it then that is going to vivify that particular depression and cause the proper vertical motion that will draw in all the things necessary for the manifestation of that particular idea whether it's people um, conditions resources etc and that's just how you know how those things operate and there are many of you here in this room and, and I know Cena can testify to that with City Club or a jillion other projects he was involved in over his life. And I'm sure many of you here also have had certain occurrences that have happened that were the result of a strong desire to see something manifested in the world. And so I would like to open up the room to a discussion. Uh, I asked Ellie, by the way, to put an image of the magician in the newsletter, and it came from the Rider Waite deck. Mm -hmm. And you see the magician with his finger up pointing in the air and the other finger pointing down towards the earth. And it's, it's representative of a conduit, an individual recognizing that they are simply a channel or a vehicle through which energies flow. And that they get to take this one thing, because we had a conversation about that a couple of months ago, one thing. But that one thing, as it is ad adapted through the medium of humanity, can become something else or something speci specified from undifferentiated energy to a specified thing, whatever that is, you know, whether it's a widget or um, a car or whatever, you name it, it's there. So think about yourself in that posture as someone who is a conduit for this energy and as it flows through you and receives the, shall we say, the orientation of your own imagery about what it is you want to manifest and how it then becomes something on the physical plane. So I'm sure you all have some instances in your life where that's happened, uh, and or any other comments that you might have about this sort of preliminary introduction to this idea. The floor is open. Um, what you're saying I, I know is right, but uh, the, in order for manifestation to occur properly, you have to be one-pointed in your idea and have no interference. Right. So I kind of alluded to that when I talked about the distractions that occur. So, um, well, let's just use a relationship, for example, and you find the love of your life, and seven years go by or whatever, and all of a sudden, there's another relationship begins to take your attention. And so all of your energy and attention has been focused on this relationship, but when it starts to be distracted and go towards another place, this relationship goes into peril and could possibly die as a consequence of your attention going towards something else. Mm -hmm. And so not only is it required to nurture that, um, that attention on the heart of your, your heart's desire, 
uh, in the process of manifestation, but if you want to keep it and sustain it, then that has to be uh, tended to as well. Distraction is the recipe for the end of the story. Then there's another piece, that if you want this and you want that, what happens very often is you get something that's in between, or, <laughs> yeah. and, and uh, you never look, saw that coming, yeah. but it's a result of yeah. Sort of a resultant vector between the two forces. Well, that's a process of, of technique, yeah, and, and distraction. So you might end up, instead of this beautiful thing, you wanted some grisly creature with teeth that bite, and then you got to... The good news is that you can change that. You can adapt it and make adjustments. But certainly, um, things can come in, and we... This happens all the time. We think about what we want, and we have an imagery beginning to develop, strong meditations and great beginnings, and then we spend the rest of the day thinking about why it isn't going to happen. <laughs> and that is absolutely the leveler of that of that process. A good reminder is you can't have it all and you can't have it both ways. <laughs> yeah. How does intention line up with time? Well, quite often I've had projects that I intended, got great intention, and the timing just <coughs> wasn't quite right. Yeah, well timing is one of the greatest mysteries that, that we are faced with at this time. Um, time and space. <clears throat> so the major arcana in the Tarot, for example, deals with the dimension of space. The minor arcana in Tarot, which I call it the not so minor arcana, deals with the dimension of time. So you have these two sort of decks that are combined together. One represents space, the other represents time. And then you're the third component that <clears throat> engages in time and space with your context, whatever it is that's going on in your life. But the timing of things <clears throat> also has a lot to do with capacity. So, for example, if somebody wants to make, you know, generate a large amount of money, just as an example, um, they might want to learn how to make a dollar first, <laughs> or ten, or a hundred, or ten thousand, before going for the big donut. Because if you can't be faithful and generate things in small quantities, it's un it, the probability is exceedingly low that you'll be successful in great things. So timing fits into that relative to capacity, and it also fits into our um, how imminent is the need for this thing to be manifested. Because a lot of times we get projects going and they get put on the back burner. And they're still there. Mozart used to, you know, con you know create and con uh, um, compose a, a piece of music and he would put it on his mental shelf off to the side. He would never write it down. He would put it on his mental shelf and then he'd do something else and maybe he'd put that on another mental shelf and then go back to this one and finish it up. So the timing is uh, how important is the is the the manifestation of this thing? What is your timetable for that? And what is your capacity to bring that into manifestation? Uh, you may need to be able to um, develop certain things and create the steps that are necessary uh, for something to come into being. Did I see a hand up over there? Nessie. <clears throat> um, I've also well, excuse me, Ness. Did I answer your question, by the yeah. way? Okay. All right. Well, and to add to that, um, I've also been challenged with the law of detachment, the concept of detachment, to detach from that thing that I want enough to let it happen because when I get in there and I want it, and the more I want it, the more I keep it from me. It's just another aspect for me. Kevin, are you talking about some, creating something from absolutely nothing or creating it from taking an energy and almost like channeling it has to go through one particular individual being in order to manifest or it could go through some, it, it'll come out in different uh, manifestations depending on who that idea Effect. So, who gives that okay. idea their attention? Mm -hmm. Well, you're, you're asking a couple of questions, <clears throat> and then I'll try to answer them. One is that, you know, we, we've kind of gotten into this old translation of, of Genesis where it says that creation is the manifestation of something out of nothing. But that's actually not true. There is a something, and that's something, <clears throat> it's a universal substance, undifferentiated. It's very much akin to the Tao in the Eastern philosophy. So Lao Tzu, the great Taoist philosopher, said the Tao, which is the topic of conversation, is not the Tao. Because as soon as you start to say what it is, then it's not that anymore. Because it's undifferentiated. It's a zero. 
but it has but it is a substance that is has no quality to it whatsoever totally undifferentiated and it is pervasive throughout the cosmos and we learn how to we learn how to work with that so the individual then works with that substance and um, you know in, in a book I wrote called uh, I think it was the, the first one the cube of space I call the universal substance jello <laughs> okay <laughs> and you put it in a mold it could be a bozo or the clown mold or it could be some fine little ripply thing or whatever but it takes on the form of the mold in which it enters into that's why in in the in the western system particularly in the tarot the chalice is a symbol of the mold that the one substance comes into the chalice and the chalice contains it and then differentiates it through containership so the container or the shape of the container will determine um, what that thing is going to be like. So, as you were saying, the individual will actually determine uh, the variety of things that can become manifest. If you took five people and put them in different wood shops and make a chair, you're not, you're not going to get the same chair from five people. They'll make, but but the interesting thing about a chair is that it, it's an archetype. And all, ver and all archetypes are verbs, by the way. There's a grammar to all this. So if we look at an archetype as an energy, as a verb, verb is action, it's movement. So the, the manifested thing satisfies an archetype. And as far as a chair is concerned, it's to sit. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to sit on? A beanbag chair? A chair like this? A lazy boy? A barrel? I mean, so there's all these infinite possibilities for chairness or to sit, to satisfy the need to sit. And so anybody has the capacity to create their own unique version of whatever it is that needs to be manifested. Say, Kevin, would a good, manifest, uh, would a good um, analogy for this be something like the dark energy that yeah. we can't see it? Yeah. It's the universe. Yeah. It, we know it's there, yeah. but we have no idea how to interact with it. Yeah. Uh, we have no scientific way, to, uh, but but we interact with it all the time, right. even though we don't know. It's like um, back in the 1850s, there was a, a famous oh, author called okay. Eliphas Levi. Some of you may or may not have heard of him, but he um, was called the father of the French occult revival. And what he did was he brought forth a lot of the information that he used to get burned at the stake for back in the you know anywhere from the 10th through the 17th century, you know. Uh, you know, if you dabbled in that kind of stuff, you were you were risking being put to death on one way or another. So he talked about it, and he called the dark matter the astral light. And in, in the 1850s, he wrote a statement that said that uh, the time will come when humanity will be able to work with this astral light, bring coldness in the heat of summer and warmth in the cold of winter, or throw the world into confusion by its power. And so we have air conditioning, and we have heating systems, we have uh, weapons of mass destruction that could throw the world into confusion. So it's the same energy, and it's being applied in different ways, and depending upon the motivation and the intent of the individual will determine what, how it manifests in the world. So, did I answer your question? Yes, okay. Brother Cena. Uh, I love that picture of the magician having touching the sky and the earth. But I totally get it as a conduit, and you had brought it before, so yep. we had studied it closely. What would be the equivalent of that image when a group uh, is trying to create? The analogy of Jesus only had 12 disciples, and look what he did with it. How, yep. how would you convey that image? Well, <clears throat> this gets into a, 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 an interesting subject, and I'm going to go there with you, and so bear with me, and you don't have to accept it. But when I've had a group of people say, uh, you know, five or three or more or whatever, X, whatever the number is, you know, I have them sit and recognize the fact that we, we all have our own individual, we'll call it logoic center. Um, in Christianity, it's called the soul. Um, there are uh, in other areas it's called something else, but let's just for the sake of argument call it that. <clears throat> but that's the individual part. But if one studies some of the other ontological models, such as the Kabbalah, there is an oversoul. There's an oversoul for humanity, which encompasses the entire planet, and everyone is connected to that, and it's called neshama. Okay, and but there's also an oversoul for a group. 
So if you have people who come together for a purpose, so I have people will meditate on a, on a golden sphere above the group and have a thread come from the sphere connecting to the crown chakra of each individual there and simultaneously the individual egoic center going around this way but both ways at the same time. It's kind of a fun visualization to watch this pulse going back and forth like this. So you're connected heart to heart and mind to mind but through this one center uh, whose purpose we try to manifest together as a group. So you try to visually connect with that and, and look at the energetic connection between yourself and those who are participating in the group. That's one, one possibility. Uh, if you can't get a uniformity of mind in a group and a, uni and a uniformed intention, then uh, that's the recipe for the group not to work and, and achieve anything. Well, there is, there is a biblical statement to that, Sina. Uh, you know, in, in the book of Revelation, it talks about 144,000 being saved. Um, that's, the, that's the idea. But it's, it's an analogy. And, you know, I had something, I, I don't remember all the details now, but it has to do partially with, with final Aleph. It's one of the letters that isn't usually... Aleph is the one that's attributed to zero. It's one of the letters that has no sound. But it's in... It's in the alphabet, and, and it wasn't until the 10th century they made these little marks to go under Dageshes and Holums and so on to give it a sound, a vowel sound. But fundamentally, it doesn't have any sound. So, but its final value is a 1,000. And so there's a multiplication that takes place with this idea of 144,000. It's bringing in this substance through the vehicle, which the zero represents that, through the vehicle of humanity and, um, and bringing about sort of a, a confluence of ideas or um, a congruency between the thought forms of humanity itself as a whole. And that's the idea of salvation for humanity when we actually operate as a single entity. That's way down the road, but that's the, that's the idea behind that, the analogy behind the 144,000. You, know, you can have a group work together, but we're, right now we're kind of struggling having a nation work together. <laughs> you know, just we're looking at the political climate not just of this country, but all around the world. It's very rare to see that conformity of thought. Aaron? I was just reading <clears throat> recently, I think it was in the book of John in the New Testament, but I might be mistaken about which book, but it was a statement about God creating light out of the darkness, but the darkness did not understand the light. Doctor, the darkness comprehendeth it not, yeah. So <clears throat> this brings up a really interesting subject, too, about light. Um, because in our sense, the, all of our experience of light has to do with external light for the most part. I mean, that's the fundamental um, physical as application of light. But there are types of light that exist. There's the light of the form, which is pretty much what we experience in this room. Then there's the light of the mind. And, and there are many, many allusions to that, like the concept of illumination, the illumination of the mind or an enlightened mind. That has its own light. And we've had many experiences, I'm sure, individually, particularly with children, adolescent ones in particular, that you try to shed the light of your wisdom about things that you did and got in trouble with and didn't work out so well. Try to give them some damage control information. If you do this, then this is liable to be the outcome. And they don't believe you because they don't have the light of the mind to, to perceive what you're saying. And sure enough, they come back later on, usually when they're in their 20s, recognizing you maybe you knew something after all. But the, the, the idea of the light of the mind is that it gives you a frame of reference or a perception that others do not have. They don't have that light and therefore cannot reach that particular awareness that somebody of a greater uh, capacity can. And then there's the light of the spirit, which is transcendent to that. And so it deals with the physical aspect, um, the, uh, the mind aspect, and the spiritual aspect. Three different things. Body, soul and spirit and they're very different different in their ontological levels not in their fundamental substance so um the light is darkness to those who can't perceive it and so there's this idea then that um in especially in the capitalistic system <clears throat> when you go up the tree of life after you reach the very top sphere there are three the three veils and they're called the you know the radiant darkness there, it's a place that you cannot see the, the, what that is because you don't have the equipment to perceive it. 
and we have that even on the lower levels. Um, you know, okay, we're, we're, we're pushing it, trying to really uh, bring in the light of the mind, but what lies beyond that is the light of intuition, or the Buddhic principle that, that uh, the historical Buddha talked about. To be able to truly have an intuitive capacity to see things as they are, not hunches, which is often confused with intuition, but to be able to actually see things as they exist on their own terms. Um, so it's called the doctrine of swabhavat, that something is what it is independent of what you think it is. And uh, so somebody may see me and think that I'm whatever, you know, a very positive, very negative thing, they might perceive that, and then there's how I am independent of what they think of me. And that's true for everybody. Look. There's some research that's come out recently about intuition and how much that plays in not only perception but decision making etc and there are the people that study this stuff say there are just millions of neurons that are firing mm -hmm. milliseconds when you meet somebody you know we size each other up so quickly like dogs you know they, dogs they sense dogs. you know the, um, but the, uh, the, the conscious mind the rational mind spends a lot of energy trying to justify uh, a conscious decision about mm -hmm. how to re react to something intuitive. And so they've been able to track what parts of the brain are most active in those first milliseconds. And, um, and the energy really shifts dramatically from the centers that are perceptive and intuitive to the more rational. But most of us think that we're making rational decisions about things. And in fact, you know, it, we're... We're operating with millions of, of neurons with our own historical perspective. So it's hard to see. It, it's hard to not use the rational mind sure. to try and understand what is and what we're intuitively responding to. Well, if we are, in fact, intuitively responding at all, um, because we, we tend to resolve ourselves to the familiar. So you meet somebody, oh, that reminds me of Joe, and I didn't like Joe, and I don't like him either. <laughs> um, you know, those kinds of things happen all the time. But we have to get out of that place if we continually stay in, in, um, in, the, in the rational mode. And now, this is a very sticky wicket here, because rational mode is exceedingly important. It brings us to the threshold of an ontological amniotic sac that we need it to bring us to a certain place. But then there is this sort of amniotic sac that goes from the monastic principle or the principle of mind that gets us to that threshold. And then beyond that is the intuitional or Buddhic consciousness. And slowly, because of the frustration we feel, thinking that, oh yeah, I got it down, I got the rational, but then you start hitting a wall and you know that it's not it. There's something else beyond that. And you start to perforate it just like an, uh, a fetus does or an infant does in utero, and it and it's breaks the waters. That's a moment when you no longer have to operate from a rational mind, but up to that point you do. And it brings you to that threshold, and, uh, and then you begin to see things in a whole different light. But we, yeah, we are kind of stuck in that until we're able to uh, get unstuck, I guess. For <laughs> Yeah. Uh, since, if it's true that our rational mind just justifies what we, we intuited was right or wrong in the first place, a lot of this has to do with moral judgments. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things they recommend is having a dialogue with yourself. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. So separate a part of yourself that can question the judgments, question the assumptions, question, question the justifications. Because a lot of our rationalizing is justifying to ourselves why we want yeah. to do or don't want to do something we intuited very quickly. Yeah, and that's just part of the rational process. There's also reason and logic that brings us to an awareness and also through inferential cognition being able to gather new ideas and take us further down the road than we would have been otherwise. So there's a there's a mixed bag. There's that part of, of the rational mind that's in what is called lower manas. It's actually called kama manas, and that is the, the place in between the emotional nature and the mental nature. And they kind of get mixed up together. And so we tend, that's where that justification takes place and the emotional aspect of the mind that kind of gets us into trouble. But as one moves further up the, uh, the ontological plane of mind to the higher aspect of the mind, then you use reason and logic to take a premise and then find out X plus Y equals Z. Well, how do you know what Z is? 
And so you've, you're able to actually, in almost an algebraic way or a geometrical way, find out the unknown. Science does it all the time. So what I'm trying to do is, one, say, yes, we have those problems that you're referring to, um, and they occur at a certain strata in the mind process. But there are other levels of the mental, or I call it the monastic plane, that are transcended to that and then slowly bring us into this place where we begin to perforate that 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 ring past knot, if you will, or that amniotic sac that brings us into a whole new um, level of awareness that... Um, the great avatars of the ages have talked about the Buddha, the Christ, Krishna, and Zarathustra, etc. Duncan, oh, wait a minute. We have a gentleman behind you there. <clears throat> First off, I'd say anyone who wants to go into the behavioral aspects of this discussion you and Luther have could get the book Think Fast, Think Slow by Daniel Kahneman, started with a K. Secondly, when you talked about the 12 disciples, I was thinking about research that uh, strongly suggests, if not proves, that when a group of musicians are playing together and really making music together, their hearts fall into synchronization. They beat together. Yeah. And thirdly, if I may, <clears throat> I'm not able to distinguish in your diction between the word intention and attention. But I think that they're perhaps part of the same pair. I, well, I'll confess, I was throwing a baseball not long ago and throwing to a fellow who was pretending to be a catcher, and he was giving me a target. I found out that when I had the intention of hitting the target and also concentrated on hitting the target, I hit the target three times out of four. It was an amazing lesson to me. Too late to be learned. <laughs> <laughs> you missed your opportunity as a closer. <laughs> Sorry? You missed your opportunity as a closer, a ninth I, inning closer. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm still waiting for the New York Yankees to call. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I understand the question, and but there, you know, I'm coming from, I didn't invent many the things that I'm talking about. These are areas of study and practice that I've been in. And so this whole concept of intention and attention, they're kind of like two sides of a coin, like wisdom and love. They, they, are, they are intimately related, and yet there are different applications. And so when I heard you describe uh, uh, your process of throwing the baseball, what I really heard was attention all the way through. Um, and not so much the, the idea of you know, visualizing the whole process and then doing it but actually focusing on it. There was a lady who was a great uh, golf coach, and she was working with these um, executive gentlemen, and they kept hitting this ball into the sand trap on this particular hole. And she said, well, what are you looking at? And they said, the sand trap. <laughs> she said, well, don't. don't. Look at the sand trap. So there's these things are, where you put your attention, that's where things are going to go. Well, I've been influenced by the word intention because a friend is reading a book on the power of intention. Uh-huh. I can't tell you the author, but you may be familiar with it. Well, there were several that wrote, um, probably the one of the most famous was Napoleon Hill, Think, Think and Grow Rich, <laughs> that kind of stuff, or The Secret that came out a while ago. But they only give you a very cursory, um, cliff note version of how this thing works. And there is there's a, a deep science, not science relative to um, our, our general idea of it, but in terms of what is called occult science looking at energies and forces that lie behind the, the, the object that is in existence. What is the causal factors for the existence of these things? And there are energies and forces that lie behind each and, one of, each and every one of us that caused us to be what we are and, um, and cause us to do the things we do. So there's a whole area of forces that, that, that have a confluence within this particular individual structure. And you're saying that's cult science? O-C-C-U-L-T, occult. Occult. Not cult. Although there are cults <laughs> that use cults. it. There can be cults, but occult, it just strictly means like, for example, when you have a total eclipse of the sun, it's called an occultation of the sun. That's a astronomical term, which means you can't see it. <laughs> it's hidden, <laughs> hidden from view. And so occult science is the science of studying the things you can't see.
hidden science. Yeah, you know? it's a hidden science. Duncan. So I often come into contact with the um, the intentions, or rather, attentions of the people that I interact with, and oftentimes people will get very testy if you challenge their intentions or attentions, even when those attentions and intentions are not theirs. And yet, without a barrier between myself and them, I find my intentions warped or changed subtly by the people around me. And, you know, I naturally want to go into my own cave or, like, take a little bit and, like, clear out my intentions after interacting with other people. But on the other hand, if I maintain my own will, my own intention, my own design with 100% focus, I miss out on learning from the other people around me. So it's, it's a two-part question. How to, um, how to interact with other people in a way where I keep my own intentional center, but also impermeable to the truth, where I, which I don't see from others. Okay, that, that, that's a great question. I, I'm going to give you an example, and I, um, I'm involved in a project right now that um, in the Grand Lodge of Colorado, this Masonic body that encompasses the whole state, they're going to rewrite their entire book of constitutions, everything. They're going to bring it up to date. And I'm getting all these submissions. I'm in charge of that. So I'm getting all these submissions from people. That some of them are like, whoa, where did you get that from? And, and, and so the big question is I'm writing to everybody. I said, what do you think masonry is? What is your motivation behind saying this? And how does that affect the whole body of individuals that are involved in this? Before you ever change anything, before you propose anything, these are the questions you need to answer for yourself. <laughs> Because there's always somebody who has an opinion about something. Now, if you have a very firm idea about what it is you want to accomplish, and other people come in and you share, uh, and this is another whole thing too, you share your ideas with someone, they're going to offer their input. Um, but at the same time, when you are involved in protecting this process, that's when silence is really important. So in, in there's an old occult maxim that says, to know, to will, to dare, and to keep silent. You know what you want? To dare and to go into activity. To will. Excuse me, I got it back. To know what you want to do. To will it to happen. Um, and to dare to go into activity and then be silent. Energetically, people spend a lot of energy talking about what they're going to do. And they spend the energy they would otherwise use in implementing that thing. Now, if you share your project or intention with somebody else and if they're not on line with that they're, they can create a counter force that will disrupt what you're trying to do so you can always talk with individuals who are supportive of what you're trying to accomplish and listen to what they have to say but uh, there's always this idea of keeping close guard on your thoughts and your words relative to what you're engaged in until it actually has been set into motion and that um the interference that would come from others is, is, is less potent. It's a really difficult thing to do. But there are a lot of people that talk about what they want to do and then never do it. But And, and like I say, you're going to get different opinions because everybody's different. And, and there might be some congruity in that, but there's also people, why do you want to do that? And then they'll tell you why you're, what they think you should do as opposed to what you think you ought to do. So there's wisdom to be gained from others, and there's also interference that can happen as a consequence of that. On a practical level again? Just the process. There was nothing impractical about no, that, no, by no, the no, way. No, okay, no, I'm just letting you know. That's good. It's um, the discipline of dialogue, you know, as a, as a um, conversational discipline is based on the notion of inquiry. And if um, you have an agreement to enter into a dialogue with somebody, then you agree with some principles about how we're going to engage in the conversation. And the, again, the fundamental principle around that is deeper and deeper inquiry, many levels of why. So the seven why is some people, W-H-Y. Why do you feel that? Why do we think that? Well, you know, it's just peeling back to um, where the commonalities of experience might be, or where there may be some fundamental truth, or not. Uh, but, I mean, that's one thing that people have been trying to do for years now. And, uh, to
to counterbalance the kind of situation that you're talking about where you, it becomes a clash of things that are hard to even understand what's clashing. Does that make any sense to you? Are you familiar with dialogue as a discipline? Um, I'm, I'm certainly familiar with, with talking out and going deeper to motives and motives and motives behind it. And it's my understanding that it typically goes back to either a deep self-induced or other-induced childhood trauma. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's the ultimate why behind limited personalities is a boundary between self and other, right? And it's often very difficult to have these discussions with people, A, because it takes so much time, and B, because it ends in addressing a pain, um, either in the self or in the other, which can be very delicate. And yeah, that's, the reason that's one possibility. I mean, there are other ways, other levels of dialogue that don't necessarily... Hmm. Go to that point. I have a lot to and learn. Just, yeah. and we're all facing the same challenges, I think. Hmm. The word that comes to my mind is discrimination. Mm -hmm. uh, discrimination around um, what you choose to take in or not, and use your reason and logic to decide whether or not that may be true for you. You, what's your, what's your name? I'm Eric. Eric, okay. I I heard about a medicine wheel that sounds like it's structured similar to what you just described. With I don't remember the first step, but then willing, uh, willing into action, daring, <coughs> daring to act. Uh, Can everybody hear Eric over there? No. Speak up a little. Yeah. Um, Mostly it's just a comparison about this last part that you mentioned about going silent. And this similar medicine wheel, um, it had to do with meeting and interacting in relationships. And the first step was basically just showing up and then uh, speaking your truths, then listening compassionately. And the final step was not being um, attached to the outcome. Let going of outcomes. How does that compare with going silent necessarily? Okay, well we're dealing with I think two different phenomena here. Okay, so there is there is the idea of, of dialogue with individuals around subjects. And they can be personal issues, family issues, they can be all kinds of things. What I'm talking about here is the process of creation. Okay? And and so it's not necessarily about a personal dialogue as it is as much about one person or a group of individuals trying to bring something into the world. Now, in the context of a group work, then there's a lot of dialogue that goes on. But they're, they're on the same page because there's a, in, there's a collective motive that's going on. Um, if you start to talk to individuals outside of that circle who have, haven't come along, if you will, with the evolution of the conversation and are, are caught in their judgmental mode or an example, you know, there are people who have uh, religious limitations because of their, their own constructs and when they see something outside of that context, they can respond even violently, let alone or just negatively to that. So you want to be able to be uh, in the group of individuals that are working towards the manifestation of something. When you're dealing with personal issues in a, in a group context or uh, you know, in some relationship or another, those are really important practices to have. But they're not, it's not necessarily the same phenomenon. That's what I'm trying to draw the distinction here. But in that going silent, is there still some degree of, like, vigilance? Well, the silence is the vigilance. Because, you know, if you, if you look at a, an animal with, a, with an infant, like a, a bear cub, for example, and its mother, that mother is going to be pretty aggressive about protecting it. Okay. Um, if you have something you're trying to bring into the world, there is a sense of, of protecting it as a, as a manifesting life. It hasn't been born yet, but it's in the process of development. It's in utero, if you will. And so there's a certain protection that goes on with that. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm, I'm answering your question because I, I just don't want to get caught up in, the, in these two very different contexts and think that they're the same. Okay. Erin. So, going back <clears throat> to intention, you know, I understand setting intentions for myself, 
But where I struggle is leading a group and setting intentions for the group and mm -hmm. not feeling like a dictator. You know, I worry that like I'm pushing my will, my intentions on this group. Mm -hmm. How do you sort of do that? Okay, well, once again, you got. first of all, you have to understand what the context is and the purpose behind the group coming together, mm -hmm. okay? If it's for the study of a particular subject, then you have every right to impose the purpose of that on people. And they start, the subject is buggy whips and somebody starts talking about carburetors, then, you know, they don't, they don't mix, right? Yeah. So, um, so why, why have we come together? And, you know, there are many times I've come together in this, you know, in the Western Mysteries talk, and there would be one person that would come in and they, they had an agenda and they all, it's always the same subject and somehow they always figure out how this is going to relate to that subject. Yeah. And it doesn't. <laughs> so you have the right to kind of bring things back to center. Um, but you have to think about the purpose for the, the, the uh, convocation of the group and what are you trying to accomplish. And then everybody can work with that. But if it's once you start going outside of the, the reason or purpose for gathering, then you have every right to impose... Martial law. <laughs> That's a little strong line, but I thought I'd throw it in. <laughs> Was there anybody else? Yes, sir. Well, Abraham Lincoln may have had a story that illustrates the point about when to stay, when to remain silent. It was about a uh, steam-powered ferry that went back and forth across the Ohio River, and it had a small boiler, so that every time the engineer blew the whistle. Forward motion stopped. Mm -hmm. The boat remained silent. It made progress. Yeah, that's that's, that's an issue. because what's and and the reason behind that is maybe that's not apropos. But it is apropos. Sorry. It's perfect because what you're doing is you're taking the energy of forward motion and putting it into a whistle. Yeah. So right. it's one force yeah. that can be used for a whistle or it can be used for moving forward. That's when you right. release the steam, the wheel doesn't turn. That's that's a that's great nice. analogy. Yeah. Yeah. You, are. yeah. Um, you spoke about two things. One, the exponential nature of group practice um, relative to individual intention, mm -hmm. um, and I'd I'd love to understand that mathematically how a group can be exponentially more effective in its intention than an individual, rather than just a linear um, addition. And and the other thing that I'd love to understand more, if you can explain it is the subtle dimensions of the hurricane analogy, not just the depression, but also the, the moisture that's needed to feed it, the, um, the toroidal. Well, you probably should talk to a uh, meteorologist about that one. I don't know that I could pontificate on all of the nuances of the formation of a hurricane. But, um, you know, the, the first question you asked has to do with force. And, you know, you might have one individual who has developed great capacity and maybe you could have the strength of three or four or five people relative to their capacity. But as a rule of thumb anyway, that if you have five people of equal capacity and are in a six person of equal capacity and that one person was by themselves and the five were together, you're putting together a force of five over a force of one. So just as a, you know, if you had a, an extra boiler, for example, on the steam engine just for the whistle, it would never affect the forward motion of the ship. Okay? Um, and so there's a group work here, two boilers working for the functioning of the of the ship, but one has a specific capacity to deal with one aspect and the other with the other one. So it's a building of force, mental force in particular, and intention uh, from a group as opposed to an individual. Steve? Can I go a little bit? No, no, no. no. <laughs> the exponential to me, come from not the fact there's five, but it's a permutation combination sure. among those five. Uh -huh. Right. That drives the exponential aspect. Yes. Okay. So that's a more mathematically correct yes. explanation, and thank you for that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> In my field, film... In, your field in of my film. field of film, <laughs> you know, quite often we're, well, th the best way to manifest projects is to have many. Uh -huh. And I've always likened the film business to being, uh, being in, a, in a big room somewhere in a loft, I may have told you this, and you have a bunch of card tables and you're building houses of cards. Each one has your intention to build and manifest that house of cards. And then people come along and open the windows. 
<laughs> and, uh, yep. and drafts come through. And so what the challenge I've always faced is the intention of the individual project versus an overall vision and intention, which I organized for my company many years ago. Sure. So there's an overall mission or vision that these, all of these projects serve. But at the same time, it's very easy to get distracted into one specific project and put all one's energy into that. Mm -hmm. Can you yeah. talk to that? Well, let's take the Constitution of the United States as a sort of a, an overall guiding thing. And then all of a sudden you get a special interest group. And, well, wait a second, this doesn't really help our bottom line, so let's change the law. <laughs> but the uh, uh, fundamental idea was that it was a, a document by, of, and for the people, not by, of, and for a special interest. And so when you have somebody come in that participates in a project, no matter what it is, they sort of get a tunnel vision on their project and maybe think it's the most important thing for the furtherance of the larger, the larger project. And that, that begins to eat up uh, energy, and it also can derail something because it doesn't take into account the larger context of which that is a part, and, not, and it's not the whole. So th that kind of, uh, you know, influence and... Uh, Distraction takes place. I mean, I, I worked with this one guy for 20 years, and he could never get out of this singular tunnel vision thing. Uh, and, and he couldn't. I mean, it w and it was his job to do that piece. But he had no credit or any sense of compassion for anybody else involved in these other projects that were also intimately connected to the success of the larger whole. And that's that's where problems arrive in, in group work, when, when somebody becomes... Uh, above the above the fray in terms of their own self importance, I don't know if that answers what you were asking there. Yeah, I, it's a, it's a challenging one to navigate through when you've got multiple endeavors going. Sure. You know, and where to put it, and a lot of it has to do with detachment from the outcome, because you watch projects fall away that you really may have been, your heart may have been very attached to, mm -hmm. and you've got to let those things fall away because something else is taking off. The, uh, yeah, the professional level, and then you, as an architect, you deal with that constantly, where you have that essence of an idea that you, you develop uh, what the project is about, what the project is going to say, what it's going to express, and, and that's the concept. And then the concept, like you were saying, it takes a life of its own. And then it's a big part of the achievement of getting it through with a successful project. It's going to be getting that attention from all those people that are going to be necessarily involved. You are not a single individual doing a painting. You're there putting it out in the world, you're going to have all kind of influences from consultants, contractors, builders, and so on, that will all have their input. Mm -hmm. And great, successful architects are not the ones that come with a brilliant idea. They're the ones that <coughs> can come with a concept and in spite of all those influences and all those expertise and so on can carry a project through that at the end the concept is still living and actually better. Yeah. It's actually better than it would have been if it would have been a single man going through his own idea. I mean, this the, um, what is the book, uh, the Ayn Rand, or the book, uh, that, that's a total bit. Yep. But it has been influencing generations and generations of designers, architects, and so on, because that's not what it's about. It's a group process. Well, you just described um, the story of the building of King Solomon's Temple. You know, there's a little quote about that, and it says that um, all the work, there were uh, three grandmasters, 80,000 fellow craft, and uh, 3,000 master masons, and 70,000 uh, entered apprentices or beasts of burden. All were so classed and arranged that neither envy, pride, or discord was experienced in the building of the temple. And that he would, through his own wisdom, he was able to have the vision, put people to labor, 
and class them according to their capacities, and they all work together. And it says that when the temple was completed, it fit together with such exact nicety that it had more the appearance of the handiwork of the supreme architect of the universe than that of human hands. And so that what you just said was there comes right out of that story of the building of that temple. Yeah. And it takes all of that coordination and selflessness and vision and being able to adhere to the, the principal idea that, that precipitated the whole thing. And then the outcome is far greater than you could ever expect. And yeah. getting through and getting all those inputs and getting something that is so rich. Yeah. And that's where the talent is. Yeah. Do you have some contact info on that contract? <laughs> <laughs> Well, if there's nothing else, I think we're just... Uh, oh, wait a minute. A couple of was, there, was there a hand up over there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got time. Go ahead, sir. Sure. Uh, I, I'm still thinking about, well, thinking about your discussion with Lou. But what I mean to say is I'm not thinking. My brain is still working on it. I don't believe that I control my brain. Mm -hmm. I think I provide it with the nutrients that it... I, being my system, yeah. provides it with what it needs to operate. And then it frequently tells me what it's doing. Uh, and what it has just told me is that I think what you were talking about is exponential and not combinatorial. Because if you take two people, and uh, that's the, the square of the interaction, and then you add the third person and square, you get the square of the interactions. Fourth person, square, four, and that's an exponential function. Mm -hmm. There's the, the complexity of the interactions. Yeah, that's right. It goes exponentially. Mm -hmm. I would certainly agree with that. But it's true, you can take any combination of that group uh, and do the combinatorial problem, and that's a big number too, mm -hmm. if the number of if the group is eight or something like that. I once worked the combinatorial on the, the scale of eight, eight notes. And the number of melodies that you can get with just whole notes from that scale is a huge number. So big you don't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that's afterthoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Great, great lunch, great talk. Thank you. We just heard it from the boss, we're done. <laughs> <laughs>